We have started to record the most recent session of SPCH 1113, Introduction to Public Speaking, for the first summer session. It is Wednesday, June 5th, 2024. What you see on the screen is the lineup for tomorrow, as all of your presentations are going to be due to my SAU email address, which is jereppert at saumag.edu, no later than Thursday at 5.30. My guess is that I will have all of your speech videos ready to go, start my own instructor course video recording session sometime around 6 p.m., with the video obviously being longer than 30 minutes to include my comments, always couched in positive constructive criticism, more than likely posting them on Blackboard Ultra around 8 p.m. I hope to have everything graded by the time we meet on Monday, but that is contingent upon all of you making certain that the recording that you send to me in your outgoing email is seen and heard by you. Just because you send something to me does not always mean that I receive it. So send me either a link to your YouTube channel or a link to whatever platform, most often Loom, sometimes Microsoft SharePoint, that works for you. But don't assume that I can see it or that I can hear it. Always double check everything, and that includes this. Remember when I was showing you my headphones the other day, indicating that when you record, and you have some type of interactivity like audio along with your video, you want to make certain that you have your headphones plugged in. If not, you're going to get double audio. You're going to get that feedback, and we're going to hear it on the final recording that you send. So double check that. Double check this. On your webcams, if you have it, a ring light, it's not necessary. But you want to make certain that you're in an area where you are basically centered on your webcam, that the lighting is pretty decent, that you are close enough on your camera to be heard, or check the presets on your computer to make certain that your audio is going to be easily heard. There are some people, when you go to my YouTube channel, or some people in past years where they don't necessarily project and their voices are not as loud. So you want to practice all of that. On my Loom library, I have all different kinds of videos, as I showed you yesterday, that are practice that no one will ever see. Because I want to make certain that what I am projecting is going to be true to my own character, that I practice what I preach in terms of being well-structured, in terms of being conversational, extemporaneous, well-researched, well-thought-out. That's why don't be afraid to have someone look over your shoulder when it comes to your slides. Does this hang together? Does this work? Is there a spelling error? All of that matters. So when I look at this screen, having that extra day with seven people in this class, Curry, Davis, Johnson, Knuckles, Rutherford, Thompson, Torrance, use it. But if you have your presentation done to the best of your ability tonight, sometime tomorrow afternoon, that's okay. But I want to make certain that all of your work, as I indicated yesterday, is recorded for posterity. And I can joke it myself too, because whenever I record on Loom, I have an artificial intelligence generated transcript. And it showed that I actually said the first time recorded for prosperity. Nothing is ever going to be perfect. You just have to keep plugging away. When you're demonstrating a how-to speech, and I have two examples to show you as we ramp up toward our speeches tomorrow. So this is the course speech schedule. It looks slightly different because I opened up each of the windows that you're going to see before YouTube today from my website. That's why I can make it look a little bit different than what you might ordinarily see 
on Blackboard Ultra. So all speech videos or links to videos must be submitted to my email address, again, jerepert at saumag.edu, no later than each Thursday at 5.30 p.m. With that in mind, let's go to something else. The SAU speech critique is designed as a checklist, a template. So when you're honestly looking at all of the takes and trying to decide which one that you want to show in class every Thursday evening that is posted online, is your research in terms of your content thorough, organization logical, introduction relevant, main and supporting points apparent, conclusion compelling, fairness inclusive, analysis thoughtful. When it comes to your delivery, is your extemporaneous style continuous, conversational style expressive, eye contact full, articulation enunciation clear, vocal variety varied, nonverbal cues poised, persona authentic. Then when it comes to your visuals, in terms of all of these items, is your design uniform, whether it's Microsoft PowerPoint, Canva, Google Slides, font, color, shading, readable, spelling, grammar, accurate, text and image balance, comparable, because with the text and the images, that's going to spur your conversationality and extemporaneous style. Is your interactivity recurrent? If you have some type of interaction from a video, whether it's from a website or you include your own video with audio as we've seen over the past week, that's certainly acceptable. Is your storytelling dynamic, aesthetics engaging? All of these items with visuals, with delivery, with content are only going to improve over the next three weeks. As of today, this is already our sixth class session. Now let's go to one other element of interactivity. This is the syllabus with a link to my instructor website, a link to Blue Sky, which is basically like Twitter. You don't have to follow me on that platform, but electronic submission of assignments to my SAU email address. As I had indicated, always double check to make certain that you have the address correct and go to your sent email to ensure that the link works, that you can see it and hear it. Then when you scroll down here, and you've seen it before, with the demonstrative speech being worth 20 points, Canva or Google Slides, Microsoft PowerPoint, if you want, somewhere in the area of six slides with the length being four to six minutes. Remember, if you decide to use Loom, you have the 30-day free trial for a maximum of five minutes. You can't go over five or it cuts you off. So if you decide to use that, Microsoft SharePoint gives you a free 15 minutes, but I prefer Loom. Four to six minutes with a timer probably on the screen. Let me show you very quickly what my Loom library looks like. I showed you yesterday, but I continue to practice. The course overview, session one, session two, three, four, five, are all on my website, they're all on my YouTube channel, and most importantly for you, they're all on Blackboard Ultra. But I have more than five or six videos here. Different practice sessions to make certain that I'm doing it the right way. I have a paid subscription. My videos can be as long as I want. This is, if I were a student, the platform that I would use. Right there, Loom, L-O-O-M. But practice everything. 
A lot of videos that you see on here are practice. That's why today my session is probably going to be over 30 minutes. I don't want to leave anything for granted as we transition into our demonstrative speech recording session, which I will put online tomorrow evening. So that brings us to two more examples of demonstrative speeches that are on my YouTube channel. The first one that you're going to see comes from spring of 2021, but I have to do something first. Take my webcam, and I'm going to put it in the bottom right-hand portion of the screen. If I go up top, I have the appearance of looking down on people, so I'm just going to be out of the way, intentionally not making it full screen, and for at least one of these presentations, I'm going to put the closed captioning on the whole way. From the spring of 2021, this is Madison Pogue, who is a scholar athlete, and she's talking about how to babysit. Here it is. Hi, my name is Madison Pogue. I am a freshman softball player here at SAU. I'm currently an accounting major, planning on switching to an education major. So I'm super excited to see how this class helps me in the future. My demonstrative speech today is going to be about how to babysit because I found that I have lots of personal experience. So step one, what do you want to do? You want to babysit. Does anyone know you want to babysit? Probably not. So the first thing that you want to look to do is get your name out and into the community. Um, you can do this lots of different ways. You can reach out to family, friends, anything like that. One of my favorite ways is to put a virtual flyer on social media. I choose Facebook groups. Those are amazing to get in touch with parents in the community. So I put a little mock um, virtual flyer on the slide, but you just want to say your name. They need to know who you are. A picture of you so they can see who you are and kind of what you look like and kind of gauge if they want to reach out. Um, you have to say what you're posting about, being a babysitter, babysitting. Um, and then you just want some information about yourself, how old you are, certifications you may have, availability like weekends or weekdays, um, references. I like to just state that I have them and if someone wants them, they can reach out and um, get them that way. But then always put a contact, a way to contact you, pretty much. Um, so that can be an email, phone number, um, to private message you on whatever you post it on. Um, so that's super easy. But another thing I really like to stress is repeat this. Repeat it around Christmas. Um, say, hey, do you need a babysitter now? Because you need to go get some Christmas presents or anything like that. So just kind of keep doing this. Don't just do it one time. And yeah. Step two, you're going to get responses from this flyer. So you want to be able to respond back um, in a timely manner, but also in the right way. Don't text them like they're your friends, especially if you've never met them before. Um, so you want to be professional, but you also want to have a personality throughout your text too. You need to let them know, hey, I'm a kid too. I can watch your kids and have a good time. Um, but I'm also still responsible enough to answer these in a timely manner and respond in a way that shows that you're professional, but you're also there to, you know, hang out with their kids and spend time with their kids. Step three, what are you going to wear? Always wear something functional, but put together, which you can see in the picture on the left. Um, on the right, that outfit, super cute, super cute, but really if you look at it you know what can you do in that outfit um easily and everything like that babysitting probably isn't the best place to wear that outfit um so outfit isn't super important but just kind of think about it like that think through the clothes that you're wearing 
Um, so now you're all ready. You're ready to head over to the house. You want to get there 10 to 15 minutes earlier than when they said they're leaving. Um, this gives them time to kind of gather everything up and get out the door and leave and all of that stuff. And also the parents will talk to you when you get there. That brings us to step four, talk with the parents. So the parents are going to have rules um, on food or just bedtimes. What are their bedtime routines? Uh, they'll kind of go through behavior things like discipline or, you know, what's been going on recently, things like that, or things to kind of look out for. Um, and then once all that's done, they'll usually be heading out the door. So that leaves you and the kids alone. Um, and this is the best part, in my opinion, because you get to play with the kids. That's what you're there to do. You're there to have a good time with the kids and make sure they're having a good time. So some things you can do. Um, or play games. You can play hide and seek, you can play tag, um, or you can play board games. You know, that always depends on the age of the kids. You know, are the board games actually going to be played how they're supposed to? We will never know. So, you can play games, you can watch movies, pop some popcorn, sit on the couch, snuggle up and watch a movie. Um, or you can make things. You can make crafts, let them draw. You can make cupcakes or cookies, um, of course, if their parents let them. Um, but I find that most kids love baking and just making crafts. So those are super fun things to do to pass the time. Step six, this is not the fun time of the night. Um, most kids, especially if you're doing the babysitting part right, don't want to go to bed. They're having fun. Um, they have a lot of energy and they want to stay up. So I found that being nice but firm, saying, hey, it's time for you to go to bed. And like being firm doesn't mean being mean. It's just reiterating the fact, hey, it's time for bed. Um, we're not going to change anything just because your parents aren't here type of deal. Um, you just need to be proactive with the putting the kids to bed so start 10 to 15 minutes earlier than when they're supposed to be in bed um so they can brush their teeth they can fully get ready for bed and you'll probably still be a few minutes past um that sounds crazy but kids know how to stall they know every trick to stay up as long as they can okay so now you're alone with the kids uh you're alone without the kids um so you're waiting for the parents to come back, what do you do? You can play games on your phone, you can watch TV or whatever. I personally love cleaning. Um, I want to clean the house, make sure the house is all nice and ready for them when they come back. Um, I found that the parents really love that too. So that's something you could also do for a few bonus points. Step eight, the parents are back. What do you do? Ask them how their time was. Um, they'll ask you some questions. How are the kids? Um, be honest with that question um, but yeah and then after all of your little chit chat when they get back you will be paid for babysitting which is a really nice reward and then you say your goodbyes mention hey I'm here if you ever need anyone again um, and then you're finished you are done with your babysitting job um, I hope that helped some people thank you guys so much for following along and listening and I hope you guys learned something. I did something intentional at the beginning of her speech, leaving my headphones out just slightly from my computer, because you'll notice in the first couple of seconds, there was a little bit of feedback, a little bit of an echo. And that's what's going to happen on occasion when you incorporate interactivity into your presentations. That's why the headphones are so important. Doesn't mean you have to wear them unless you have a microphone attached, which is acceptable, but just be aware of those little things. And that's why you just continue to practice and watch all of the videos that we don't see outside of class. Let's go ahead and mute this, but notice the way that she has this set up. Her webcam, the default on Loom, like me, is bottom left corner. She's arranged her bullet points in such a way that very rarely does what she have on the slides impede 
with the webcam. Now you can make this a little bit larger. Mine's slightly larger than this with the with the circle. You can have the timer on the screen, which I would strongly encourage you to do. And when you scroll back, look at her title slide. She obviously has a ring light because she's very easily seen. Attractive slides all the way through. Step one. Step two. Step three. Step four. Virtually all of the time, pay attention to her eye contact. She's looking at the slide. She's looking at the webcam. She's not ever really losing her place when it comes to remaining extemporaneous. Step five. Step six. Now let's play this in real time with the closed captioning on. Is Madison speaking in a complete sentence structure? Is she looking at the camera, maintaining relatively consistent eye contact? Remember that checklist for content, delivery, and visuals. Not everything's going to be perfect. You might catch yourself in a vocalic, but that's okay. It's not a problem at all. It's never going to be perfect. For instance, on occasion, whenever I'm watching these presentations, I feel like I want to scratch my nose, but my webcam's on all the time, which is why I don't make these full screen. And if you send something to me in Loom, it will probably look just about the same way, where I'm in the corner and your Loom screen is going to be about like this. So you can visualize what that's going to look like. But nothing calls attention to itself in terms of misspelling or organizational structure is done in such a way where it is easy to follow. She recorded multiple takes, as you will also. On occasion, you'll see me do this because I want to get to the end of the speech. Watch what I do here. I'm stopping it before 7 minutes and 18 seconds. I told you previously that when you end a speech, you need to say something along the lines of thank you, but then pause. 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, and then stop. What do I do on these course videos, guys? I'll always say something along the lines of, and that concludes the recording session for today. In my mind, I'm thinking, 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, and then pause. Let me put her eyes open. But she does a very good job. Now let's go to our second and final demonstrative speech example for the day on YouTube. This was recorded during the pandemic, fall intercession of 2020. So it was very similar to the summer in that the fall intercession was during the month of December. There were 19 class sessions during the fall intercession, exactly as many as you have during the first summer session of 2024. And what Beth is going to do, we move from how to babysit, how to make an egg custard pie. Here it is. Hi everyone, my name is Beth Hervey. I am a history education major. This is my second year at SAU. Very excited to be taking these fall in, this year's fall intercession course. Uh, there's definitely a lot that you can learn from projecting yourself within public speaking, and I'm very excited for this course. Today, for my demonstrative speech, I'm going to be talking about how to bake and custard egg pie. This pie, called the egg custard pie, has been a staple within my family for many, many years. It is often not the most popular. There's not too many people that I've met throughout my time 
within college and within high school that have had an egg custard pie or even made one. So whenever I show up with it to events and Friendsgiving and things, people are always very shocked and very pleasantly surprised by it. It's been a staple, like I said, within my family always growing up. And I actually remember it as one of the very first things that I ever learned to bake and ever worked up the courage to be around an oven for because I had a horrible fear about ovens whenever I was little. Um, so of course, because I'm a history major, I had to add in the history of the egg custard pie just a little bit. I'm not going to go too overboard, but the Romans were actually the first group known to start an understanding of the egg as a use of a solidifying agent and a binding agent. So very revolutionary, something other than flour that we used to thicken things and make it light and fluffy and just delicious. Um, custards were used to fill pastry, pastries and tarts, which were smaller, but then they grew into larger filling for pies. Within Europe and Asia, there have been recipes such as the egg custard pie dating back to the Middle Ages. So this has been around for a while, and obviously it's good, so or else it wouldn't be around for so long. Thus leading us to the delicious egg custard pie that we have today. So... This is titled The Ease Within the Beginning because there's so little ingredients within an egg custard pie. It makes it very easy and there's not much baking time. Overall, it's very simple compared to many pies such as the chocolate pie or a lemon meringue pie. Very delicious, but often they take a lot of time and a lot of different ingredients. And one thing wrong can mess up the whole thing. Whereas an egg custard pie is much easier. It's much, much more simple and very good for beginner bakers. So, the recipe. This recipe that I have here on the right is actually, I had my mother send it to me from uh, back home. Uh, obviously, you can see that it's been used a lot. There's a lot of stains, a lot of junk on it because we've been using it for many, many generations. And so, the one that we're going to be using today is egg custard pie at the bottom. You see it has not very many um, ingredients and the directions aren't that long. So yet again, another example of how simple an egg custard pie is to make. So going on to the ingredients that we were saying, there's five main ingredients that are necessary. We have milk, eggs, sugar, nutmeg, and a pie crust. You can add vanilla extract. My family has never been super huge into it. It's never been something that was exactly required like we had to have it but some people really like it sometimes it gives it a really good flavor to add to it either way that is optional going on to step one the easiest way to start out with any sort of baking is to set out all of your ingredients to begin with for one this lets you know that if you're missing something you need to go and get it beforehand or maybe you shouldn't even start at all because you can get it the next time you go to the store it also makes sure that you're not scrambling around during the baking process because sometimes you can get a little bit hectic, you might break things. So when you have everything perfectly lined out, it really makes things just easier for you overall and it makes the process much quicker. And overall, setting everything else just gives you a really nice sense of preparation, which I feel like everyone needs and wants in their life. So moving on to step two, if you're using a store-bought pie crust, which is what most people do, it's a lot cheaper and not necessarily cheaper but it's a lot faster a lot of times so the first thing you want to do is you're going to need to set it out at room temperature when pie crusts sit in the fridge or come straight from the store they're a lot of times hard they're really hard to manipulate and whenever they go in like that a lot of times you're having to rip them to even get them to lay flat in the pan and it also just doesn't give you quite as good of a flaky and buttery flavor unless you let it sit out so once the crust is at room temperature, place it in the pie dish, pat it down nice and good. Note that a deep dish pot pan, in my opinion, is much better for a egg custard pie because this is going to be a very liquidy mixture until it gets um, in the oven and it actually solidifies from the eggs. Um, so with that, if you have it in a very thin pan, it's much easier to slosh around versus a deep dish pan. It's, it's very, it's much easier to handle. So then what we're going to do with the crust is we are going to take our pointer finger and our, in, and our thumb finger, um, put them about an inch apart, our right hand or left hand, it depends on if you're right or left handed, and then you're going to take your thumb from your other hand and you're going to push them together like this and make V shapes. You can see a good example over here on the right. It's very com common, probably the most simple and the most common 
um, and it just really keeps, especially for a custard, it keeps everything in. If you do slosh, you're much more likely to keep it in because you have all those sides around. I always say that it looks like a sunflower. It's just very pretty, very easy. So going on to step two, you're going to need to take three eggs, whisk them together until foamy. It's always good to whisk your eggs in an, its own separate thing. For us, we have our own chickens, so you really need to check the eggs before you start putting them into other things. So you put them in a little thing, whisk them together, together until they're foamy, as the recipe says. And then you're going to need to add three-fourths a cup of sugar, which honestly is not that much sugar compared to a lot of other pies, and whisk until that's mixed. Doesn't take much time at all. This would also be the time to add some vanilla extract if you want. It's all completely up to you. After that, you need to add two cups of milk and then stir it all together. You would pour that into your, uh, into your pie crust in your pan that we made earlier, and then sprinkle it with nutmeg. And compared to other pies, that is very, very simple. And so, Going on to step four, um, you're going to need to preheat your oven to 425 beforehand, which is a pretty high temperature. So I would recommend getting a pie crust covering, which you can see in the top right corner, to help protect the outer crust in this high temperature. And you're just going to need to put it in there, put it in there for 25 minutes, which is honestly pretty short for um, a pie. Sometimes things such as pumpkin pie take oh, well over an hour. So 25 minutes. Pull it out, let it cool, and it is ready to serve. So, in conclusion, I hope that this encourages you to making a custard pie the next time you're needing any sort of something sweet or any sort of dessert to bring somewhere. It's very simple, you see, 25 minutes, perfect amount of time for you to get ready while it's in the oven, and it's just an overall delicious dish. Even though some people are often skeptical because egg custard sometimes doesn't sound the most appealing. It's very delicious very not overbearing and just a wonderful dessert and it will definitely be a showstopper if you bring it somewhere so i hope you enjoyed how to make an egg custard pie i hope that you go out and make your own and once again my name is beth harvey and have a great day whenever we're watching her speech it reminds me of something if you ever have any lettering on your clothes and when Beth leans back you can tell she has some type of lettering on her clothes that's a dead giveaway if you did not reverse the image on your webcam some people forget that this area if you don't pay attention to it is going to be recording in a reverse image so for instance in my case whenever I first was using loom I noticed that items on this side of my webcam were reversed. So you always want to double check to make certain that your webcam is actually showing the proper image and not a mirror image. She does an excellent job here and she is closer to eight minutes as you can see. If your presentation is longer than six minutes at the maximum, that's okay. It's not going to have any negative benefit to your grade whatsoever. Let's mute it. Let's go back to the beginning. Put it in closed captioning. Now let's examine some of her slides. Title slide. Then we get into the process. Let me take the closed captioning off. I'll put it back on. History. Recipe. Nice inclusion from an old cookbook. Step one, step two, step three, step four. Now let's pick this up, closed captioning on, with the audio down. It's also helpful, guys, because you can pick up the vocalics, ers, ahs, ums, uhs, drop g's, but really you can pick up the vocalics by watching this. You'll see an uh in here occasionally or a you know. If you are noticing through your self analysis a couple of uhs, you know, a drop g, don't freak out because the more that you look at your presentations like this, 
the more you're going to improve. Speaking in complete sentences, knowing what you look like on camera. The personality from Madison with babysitting today came through. The same with Beth. Let's take this off. Let's go back and listen to roughly her last minute or so. You have all those sides wrapped. I always say that it looks like a sunflower. It's just very pretty, very easy. So going on to step two, you're going to need to take three eggs, whisk them together until foamy. It's always good to whisk your eggs in an, its own separate thing. For us, we have our own chickens, so you really need to check the eggs before you start putting them into other things. So you put them in a little thing, whisk them together, together until they're foamy, as the recipe says. Some of her text is being obscured by the webcam. It's not that big a deal right here, but when you're practicing, you'll probably want to make certain that ideally as little text as possible is being obscured by your webcam. I would probably go a little bit bigger and then work around it, whatever works for you. If you want to be in the right-hand corner like I am now or upper right, whatever is appropriate under the circumstances. Try to find some kind of dead spot on your slides, which is always going to be relatively vacant. I suppose that's why the folks at Loom decided that bottom left is the default. Microsoft SharePoint does the same thing. Like I said before, Microsoft SharePoint gives you 15 minutes of recording time free. And if you have an SAU Microsoft 365 account, it's something to experiment with. I didn't care for it because my interactivity was not exactly the way I wanted it to sound. But with a 30-day subscription or trial to Loom, five minutes is the maximum. Let's go ahead and pause that and go back to her title slide. I wanted to reinforce before we conclude for the day. I am still new to Blackboard Ultra. It's being incorporated at SAU over the summer. I used to use Blackboard Collaborate Video to record Blackboard Collaborate Ultra. All of my students primarily use Loom, and I wanted to become as comfortable with it as possible and make certain that it was uploading easily into Blackboard Ultra. That's why my course sessions early on have been no longer than 30 minutes. But just for your benefit, as we continue on during the term, like today, they're going to become longer as I become more comfortable with the technology. But as we move to informative, then persuasive, then wildcard speeches, I want to show you memorializing on those days instructor course videos more examples so you can visualize how you can improve in terms of content and delivery and visuals throughout the first summer session. Before we conclude for the day, let me show you a couple more items. My YouTube channel has everything that we've done during the term. It's also available on my website, also on Blackboard Ultra. But when you scroll through, even though we're now at wild cards and then moving down to persuasive, you're going to see different types of presentational styles. I'll show you this from next week. That was during the pandemic, spring of 2020. The young lady that you see, Jocelyn Keller, was the first person to ever use Loom in my classroom. Let's go. To where we started. Even though my webcam now is on the other side of the screen, wanted to show you one more time 
that everyone will have exactly the same amount of time to prepare each week for speeches. One full week for informative, one full week for persuasive, one full week for wild card after today. And that's what's going to take place tomorrow. The longest class session so far with all of your demonstrative speeches in one course session. Posted probably sometime around 8 p.m. If I'm you, I go back here. Using the checklist as an informal guide each week, how am I improving in all of these areas? There's no such thing as perfection, but there's certainly nothing wrong with striving for it each week. And then back here, one more time. At the syllabus, reminding you, Canva, Google Slides, Microsoft PowerPoint, somewhere in the area of six slides, double check your spelling, grammar, syntax, juxtapose the order if you think necessary, text on your slides, images, video clips, watch all of the videos and then watch them again. Watch my examples from years gone by and watch them again. Repetition matters. We'll conclude here. We're at Blackboard Ultra. The instructor course videos, and today's will be posted shortly. As I had mentioned, they will become longer than 30 minutes. Today, more than likely, is going to be in the area of 40. More speeches from years gone by will be included for next week, the week after, and our final week, so you have more examples to look at. All of these folks really did improve, and I want you to as well. This is the student preview mode of Blackboard Ultra. We have seen all of these presentations, but I will continue each week to include more, and ideally, some of yours will go right there. The instructor information area, there's a link to my website and my YouTube channel. All of the information with the syllabus, the course itinerary, the course speech schedule, and the critique. I'll place it right there as we conclude. 5.30 Thursday, try to get stuff to me before 5.30. Practice, make certain that you are sending me what you think is the best presentation. If it's a little over six minutes, that's fine. If it's just under five minutes, that's okay too. But I look forward to recording, probably starting around 6 p.m. on Thursday evening, and then posting it here on Blackboard Ultra around 8 p.m. It is finally so important that you look at your classmates' work in real time, even though your self-evaluation speech critique at the end of the semester is only going to be looking at your own improvement. But watching your classmates in real time is also going to be enormously helpful. How can you communicate on camera? It's not going to be perfect, but as you continue to watch yourself, as I told you the first day of class, the self-awareness is going to be that much more important. Don't get stressed. Just make certain that your particular topic is something that you enjoy, 
your personality comes through, and the more that you practice, the better you'll be. Good luck as we get into our session tomorrow for graded demonstrative speeches for the first summer session of 2024. And that concludes the recording session for today.